Hello and welcome to another episode of Mike and Dave's Hi-Fi Riff. I'm Mike Evans. And I'm David Price. And David, what are we going to be doing this week on Hi-Fi Riff? Well, it's going to be the Mist Amplifier 3, otherwise known as the Mist TMA3. The TMA3. Yeah. Fantastic. A bit of um, Hi-Fi legend, isn't it, really? It's uh, yeah. an iconic product, a classic product. And also, a slightly, appropriately enough, a slightly mysterious one, because... Uh, not many people know about this amp, um, I think it's true to say, uh, and it's kind of buried in the annals of uh, 80s hi-fi folklore almost, isn't it? It is. What, what year are we talking about when this first came out? Yeah, I think this was 1982. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so I think the reason why not too many people know about it is because at that time it had some really stiff competition. And I think one of the things with the Mist, it was, it was rated as a sort of very um, conservative 35 watts, something around there. And actually, the power delivery belied that. It felt like it had an awful lot more headroom than that. But I think numbers talked a bit more in those days. So people would tend to be buying, you know, say something like the Audio Lab 8000A, you know, which was 50 watts. Yep. And, and the mist kind of got a bit overlooked, didn't it? And, yeah. um, and maybe that was a mistake by, by some people. Well, I think the, I mean, the interesting thing is that the um, Japanese amplifiers at that time, then and now actually, were kind of sold off the back of their specs. So, you know, it's like, here's the amp, here's the specs, you know, X percent distortion, X number of watts per channel, and, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. And the, um, the UK, uh, British kind of, you could say, cottage industry amplifier scene, uh, because this is what we're talking about. We're yeah. talking NVA, we're talking Incatech, um, we're talking, uh, you know, not really, I think exposure and name weren't really cottage industry, but they were sort of very specialists and yes. s small niche manufacturers, weren't they? Yes. So that, that scene didn't even quote its power specs, um, no. which is just as well. If For the name, in... Nate. <laughs> exactly. I was, that was my joke. <laughs> I was so sorry. <laughs> with, its, with its insane seven watts per channel or yeah, whatever it's down, supposed down to be. Downhill with the wind behind it. Exactly. Um, but, you yeah. know, as you and I know, that the Nate is... Um, is it's sort of more than the sum of its parts. It actually, the, the current delivery is really quite superb from the Nate, and the Mist has, has very similar uh, kind of characteristics. Yes, well, the, the Nate has a superb current delivery for an amplifier with almost no power. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. The, but, yeah, the, 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 the Mist actually is kind of like that. Uh, again, it's uh, roughly 35 watts, 40 watts RMS per channel into 8 ohms. It's about 55 into 4 which by normal standards is, is a bit miserable, but it, it seems to work in practice a lot better than it measures. It really does. Yeah. It really does. Uh, um, yeah. And it's interesting because um, cause when, when they were designing this, then um, I think the, the couple of speakers which they used, um, one of them was a combination which I used myself, which yep. was the, the TMA3 with the original quad, quad electrostatics. Um, and um, they weren't the easiest speakers to drive, but the Mist and those seem to just have this incredible synergistic sound. One of my favorite systems I've ever owned, yep. without a doubt. Yep. Um, in fact, I think I swapped the Mist for an Exposure 10, and I'm not even sure it was really an upgrade yeah. um, at the time. And then the other speakers they developed these with, I think I'm right in saying, with some Celestian SL6s, which were, again, really hard to drive. Yeah, those are absolute buggers to drive. Yeah, but, um, but again, yeah. You know, the, the Mist guys are like, well, you know, if they can do this, they can do anything sort of approach. Yeah. So um, I love that. We've got one here. We've got one here. Would you yeah. like to try show it off? Yeah, you, show it off, you show it off. So this is this is really cool. And, and, and we've got a bit of a black background, but it's got this sort of gorgeous navy blue top. Um, and it's a really funky amplifier. Let me just, uh, we'll put some pictures on as well, but let me show you the back panel with this gigantic heat sink sitting out of the back yeah which um, was very uh, very useful considering uh, it, was. It, it needed to dissipate quite a lot of heat uh, from a small box but yeah. interestingly i mean this wouldn't have fitted in with any other of the parts of your system would it no. it's a totally unusual shape isn't it because yeah. it's um it's got a really weird form factor hasn't it um, it has it's it as i don't think it's full width uh, in the sense that you know your average kind of japanese amplifier was 430 mils uh, across it, it, it it's small. It's slightly less wide. It's got a. It's very narrow as well and slimline. Um, so kind of the uh, it, it's the antithesis of the you know big butch Japanese uh, mega amp, isn't it? With its sort of yes. huge facier and stuff. And 
absolutely no power meters uh, anywhere. So I, I, you know, I think this is a gorgeous looking amp. Yeah. I really do. Um, and, and it's funny because they used to say that it, it looks better on the inside than the outside. Yeah. And I get it because if you take the lid off of one of these things, it is beautifully laid out. Yeah. You know, with this colossal yeah. toroidal transformer, yeah. which splits for preamp and power amp. Yeah. Um, and then it's got some really decent quality uh, components in here, hasn't it? From, yeah. From top to bottom. So. Absolutely. And, and this, I think, is the kind of defining part of this amp. So. The, uh, the guy who uh, designed this is uh, Michael Maloney, uh, and I interviewed him about five or six years ago uh, about it. I couldn't find any info really on the internet. You know, the kind of normal lazy journalist thing to do is to go out and Google <laughs> something. And there's almost nothing about it. So I, I tracked him down and, and did a very long interview with him. Uh, and he told me, uh, you know, the fascinating story of how it came to be. But basically, the um, his thing was that he was very interested in uh, in, in component quality, um, and this is sort of eighty two, eighty three. I think the TMA was just 80, just about eighty three. He would just done before that the Geom Pre Power okay. of eighty two, um, but he was obsessed with you know very high quality volume potentiometers. So this has got an ALPS, a, a uh, fancy Alps. Hot. Super smooth, uh, yeah, it's lovely. Absolutely, yeah. really accurate, you know, channel balance on it. Um, he's got, um, you know, a really high quality glass fiber circuit board, 1% metal film resistors, um, polypropylene, uh, uh, you know, all the latest kind of uh, best stuff he could put in there, really nice capacitors. And something, uh, you know, as I'll do my Michael Caine impression, not a lot of people know that, it's got. Hitachi MOSFETs. Okay. Um, so um, Hitachi were kind of um, really pushing the boundaries, I think, um, in the late 70s. The MOSFET itself, as an amplification device, had been around for a while, but Hitachi kind of mass productionized them and started doing what they called power MOSFET amplifiers in the late 70s. Uh, and these things um, had the ability to uh, put out a lot more power than, you know, well, in a smaller space than sort of a regular discrete transistors. Um, and also had very low distortion and so on. And they were a very kind of trendy and cool thing to have at the time, but very new and very few amplifiers had them. Um, loads do now. Sure. Uh, most, I would say most Class ABs, certainly a lot of Class ABs have our, our MOSFET base now, but so um, Michael was trailblazing then. With absolutely, this. Yeah. yeah. So this yeah. is basically it a, a lot, doesn't it? Absolutely, it's a Hitachi MOSFET amplifier um, with w with the same Hitachi circuit design for the MOSFETs, but with a really high quality implementation of you know passive uh, volume pot and um, uh, various uh, electronic components, and um, that's uh, that approach was only really popularized by Ken Ishiwata. Yeah, in the 90s, you know, when he started doing those KI signature yeah, yes. CD players and yeah, stuff, which yes. had sort of a slightly more expensive, uh, um, you know, electrolytic cap capacitors and stuff. Sure, um, sure. But he was, Ken was obsessed with the effect of component quality on sound. Um, and 10 years earlier, um, and maybe 15 years earlier, Michael Maloney from Mist was was doing that was trailblazing as you say, and and you told me a great story earlier before we we, we did this this um, riff, which was you spoke to him and said you know is there any way we could sort of get it sort of tweaked and brought up to twenty first century and have some new capacitors and whatever, and he said, no, <laughs> <laughs> no need exactly. So huh. a lot of um, uh, hi fi riff viewers will find out that we're into old amps and classic amps and we've got a lot of them between us and a lot of mine that I've had like my musical fidelity A1 mm. uh, have had to be completely rebuilt with like you know tons of new capacitors and things like that um, but um, so when I spoke to Michael um, I said you know who can service it can you service it for me and he said doesn't need it <laughs> what's yeah, the amazing. point and we've, we've, we've had a, little, a, a play with this and do you know it it's just it's brought all those memories flooding back because yeah. I used to love my TMA3. Yeah. I wish I had a pair of quad ESL 63s to, to sort of play with it, but yeah. um, sadly not. Um, but you know, we played it. We, we we played this earlier through my Linsaras, which are ridiculously hard speakers to drive. 
Um, and it sounded gorgeous, didn't it? It sounded, you know, exactly as I remember it. Yeah. Um, the thing I love about this amplifier is it, it, it has it has its own sound signature, but I think it's very lovable. Yeah. And Michael had a brilliant quote, didn't he? Which was something along the lines of, um, no one's ever phoned me to tell me it's a load of rubbish or, yeah. you know, something along those lines. And yeah. uh, which kind of speaks volumes. And I get it because yeah. why would you complain about it? It does yeah. everything beautifully. Um, and I think if you can find one of these, then... You know, it, for, for the two reasons we've just said, it's a veritable bargain. So you don't need to have it serviced or refurbished. Yep. You know, it's just, it's going to go forever. And also, it just sounds great. It really does. It'll drive yep. most loads. Yeah. Um, you know, we played sort of some modern music, you know, public service broadcasting and some, you know, some older music. And yep. it just, it's, it's not, you know how some um, integrators, cheap integrators, if you like, quote yeah. unquote, can be really quite harsh, yeah. a bit brittle on the top end. There's nothing there, is there? It's a real smoothie, isn't it? Really, it really is yeah. amazing. And it's, it's got some grunt. Yeah, it's smooth, but it doesn't have a kind of slow, sort of fat sound. It's no. tight, taut, yeah, smooth. It doesn't have a kind of chromium plated upper mid band that a lot of solid state um, steered, especially at that time. Yes. Um, it doesn't sound sort of tinselly and bright, does it? No. Um, and it's got a chunky, chewy bass that's really, you know, um, sort of boings along like a kind of rubber ball, doesn't it? So. And, and isn't it funny how this is one of the few apps we've both agreed on and owned? I know. Uh, it's yeah. very unusual. And um, and I'm, I'm, you know, really chuffed to, to, this is yours, obviously, I'm really chuffed to, to have listened to this again today. It's brilliant. It's made me wonder why I got rid of mine. Um, I wish <laughs> why I'd, did you get I rid of it? I don't know. I probably <laughs> did something stupid yeah. and swapped it for something rubbish, but... Um, but you know, I wish I'd well, kept it because it's a glorious. We've thing. all been there. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know, and and it does beg the question: you know, why didn't this sell in bucket loads? Because you know, really, it, yeah. it, it's, 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 there's nothing not to like about it. Yeah. Um, and you know, it can do an awful lot. And it's one of those products where, if you wanted to improve on this, it was what two hundred and two hundred and fifty. It started at. I think it was went a little bit higher. Didn't yeah, it? it sort of a, it ended up around two ninety three hundred quid in the mid eighties. Sure. So you know, which but, is a, a fair amount, but but not uh, not it was expense, not too too expensive. But if you wanted to have a a big upgrade from this, yeah, then you had to go to pre power territory. No two ways about it. And then you probably needed something like. I don't know, you know, like a name thirty two ninety or something, or um, exposure yeah, I mean, six be, seven eight. Or, it'd be a forty two five one one zero, wouldn't it, as yeah. your first step on the pre power run from name? Yes, um, and it wouldn't be that. I mean, I'm not sure if it'd be that much better. Um, no, makes so, you wonder, doesn't it? Yeah, maybe different, but but not necessarily better. No, sure, um, sure. But um, yeah, I mean, Michael Maloney told me that his philosophy was make it simple make it well, make it beautiful, and make it to last. And yeah. I think that's a great uh, way of describing and this thing. There you are, that's yeah, it, in a yeah. nutshell. And it's still going strong and sounding amazing. It so. is, and you know, you can, it's one of those amps you could, uh, I often just sort of stick in the cupboard for a few years, don't use it, and then when something I'm using blows up, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll, as an emergency amp, before I can get the review sample that's blown up back, you know, to the, to the um, manufacturer, this comes out and it just works like that Amazing. and it sounds great. So, Amazing. Yeah. Have you plugged this into your NS one thousands? Yes. It, <laughs> dr it drives them reasonably well. Yeah. I'd sure. Say. That's um, crazy, isn't it? Yeah. A very clean sort of. Uh, it, it was never a sort of over overly um, sort of coloured amp. It's not an. M it's not a Music of Delty A one uh, sort of. It makes everything sound lovely. Uh, it's just crisp and clean. It actually mm. sounds very modern, doesn't it? It really does. Um, so yes. and, and yeah, much does. more than it you'd does. expect. But yeah, yeah. But I, it, 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 sorry, it's it's got a really interesting uh, lineage. So uh, Michael Maloney was um, uh, he he was a, a graduate in perceptual neuropsychology. <laughs> so um, yeah, so uh, it was um, not your average kind of electronics engineer, and I think he was self-taught. And he was a valve amp fan. He was an absolutely crazy about valve amps. And he, his early life, I think, after he graduated, was spent working for a very respected uh, valve amp output transformer manufacturer in London. Wow. Oh, yeah. um, so, but he, he, he sort of, I think he built um, the, this is a sort of pub quiz question, mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, the, the first missed amplifier was called the Stage Life. Right. Um, that would be the TMA-1. Yes. Yeah. TMA-2, which some of us know, you and I would know, 
and maybe some of the viewers would know because they're as sad as us. But um, it's that was the geo. Um, yes. Okay. And um, named after his wife or something, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, his wife was called um, Mary Guillaume, uh, which is a French name. Yes. That's foreign. Um, that's uh, <laughs> French is foreign. In exactly. France. Yeah. Uh, bonjour. Um, so it, the geome they say sort of could be a kind of abbreviation of his yeah. wife's name, but with om um, uh, instead of uh, uh, um, l a u m e at the end of it. Um, and of course the uh, the, the TMA three we all think was the missed amplifier three, mm. but Michael Maloney told me he is, uh, and this is the not a lot of people know this moment. Such a gossip. So he was a big Arthur C. Clarke fan. Ah, okay. And um, okay. he was uh, very uh, into uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, so he kind of cheekily said, well, TMA could also uh, stand for Tycho Magnetic Anomalies. So there you go. Well, Which is in 2001. Exactly. I have no idea about uh, all that sort of sci fi. Amazing. Stuff, but, How cool is that? So, and what, yeah. what happened after the TMA 3? Well, um, they sort of, I mean, I think Mist was still doing the TMA three, and maybe until like the sort of mid late eighties, so maybe eighty seven, something like that. Um, but they 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 basically ended up pulling out of that market, and they made a uh, a, a a monitor studio monitor speaker, which I think might have been active. I'm not sure. I think it probably was called the Wellard, um, which is. <laughs> Uh, and, yeah. and that presumably there's something funny behind that name uh, as well. well yes. Was that Arthur C. Clarke? Uh, I don't think that was Arthur C. Clarke, that one. Um, so more like Arthur Daly. So, uh, <laughs> but he was, um, that I think, I believe, uh, so uh, Michael told me that um, uh, he sold loads of pairs to studios in the late 80s. Stock Aitken and Waterman had, a, had some, uh, even Phil Collins. So, well, well, um, so there we are. So there you go. Excellent. And um, so Mist is still... Well, the last time I spoke to him was still uh, a thing, um, and they've got their own website, and uh, but they're not they're not in domestic consumer hi-fi anymore. I, I don't you, these don't come up very often on eBay. No, um, but when they do, then you know, grab yourself a bargain kind of thing. Yeah, because um, it really is you know quite glorious. You've got to love the British engineering with the screws holding on the <laughs> the sides and the, the Allen keys holding on the front. Yeah, um, but you know inside it's just it's just a masterpiece. It really is. It, uh, we were saying earlier, it looks like a kind of really well made kit. It does, it, doesn't it? Yes. So it's yeah. actually beautifully done. The the face here and everything, the pressed steel case is all really nice. There's no kind of uh, you know really sort of bad edges or anything like that. It's no. all it all fits in. Nice and neat, and and the paint finish is excellent on the, uh, the blue paint, uh, looks fantastic, and the uh, the aluminium front is great, and I love the uh, sort of screen printed logos there. It's, I love the typeface. That's yes. super cool, isn't it? Yeah. The switches are just you, wonderful. You have, there's a combination of these switches yeah. to choose your, your which yeah. input you want to use. Exactly. And it doesn't say mist anywhere on the front. It's just no. a big logo on the back. No. Um, and interestingly, it uses the sort of the name Nate connectors. Yep. And the, Dins, the, din, yeah. The din inputs. Yeah. Um, I had to dig one of those out today to, yeah. to have a play with that. Yeah. Um, but really cool. So uh, we're loving this. Let's do it. Let's do a high five um, retro riffometer on this. Yeah. Shall we? Well, I'm going to give it ten. Mm. So I, I just think it's for what it is. It's fantastic. It's rare as hen's teeth. Um, it's bonkers. Uh, and yet it doesn't blow up all the time, and uh, you know need constantly fixing. So uh, it's, but, I mean. Why would you give it a nine and a half? There's nothing to, to knock it down, is there? It's just a terrific product. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you if one comes up and, and you're after, a, you know, a glorious retro 80s yeah. amp, this is the one to buy, I think. Well, they're so. not even that expensive, actually. No, probably not. I mean, I think they that, will be after this review. Well, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I think I think I got that um, 10 years ago or something for like 200 quid or something. Yeah, I mean, perfect. they're probably perfect. Yeah, three, 400 now for a good one, but... We're not talking mega money. No. So. Well, I'm a 10 as well. Yeah. No two ways about it. So there we go. Heard it here first. Yeah. The Miss TMA3. Absolutely. Marvellous. Well, look, Fantastic. thank you, everybody, for watching this episode of Mike and Dave's Hi-Fi Riff. Hope you've enjoyed that. Um, I've certainly enjoyed getting my memories back of this fabulous amplifier. And we'll see you at the next one. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Bye.